Welcome to another episode of All About Code, the show for XPlace++, Clipper and Visual Foxport developers. Today I would like to talk about the XPlace++ technical roadmap. In addition, with the continuous development and innovation strategy, which means that we are delivering features in an incremental fashion, we are delivering updates on a monthly or bi-monthly base with fixes and new features included, um, it makes even more sense to update the roadmap one or two times a year and publish it again. So here we are and let's start. At first, I would like to give you an idea about what's in 2.5. Then we will talk a little bit about uh, some specific areas of new features and, of course, a conclusion. So, what's in, in 2.5? First of all, <clears throat> let me explain what 2.5 means. It does not mean there will be a big bang in one or two or three years or so. It means 2.5 is just a marketing term and the version number of the product will change when we delivered all the things we have here, on, we have planned for 2.5 <clears throat> in an incremental fashion. That means for you as a subscription customer, you will get in the updates which are coming in the following month, all these features which I'm talking about. So it's an incremental delivery of new features, it's not one release in six, 12, 18, or 24 months. Said so that, 2.5 is split up into four areas. It's runtime features, where we extending the runtime in means of capabilities. Um, it's uh, assets and templates, where we want to make the development cycle with the workbench if it comes to the usage of add-ons or complex web projects more productive and more efficient and more consistent between all of you. And then there is a group of productivity enhancements to the workbench itself and of current documentation backlog, which we want to have resolved uh, with the 2.5 uh, release. Um, so let's start with the runtime features. The runtime features are split up into two groups. And this group here is basically about managing larger XBase++ solutions. XBase++ is out since <laughs> almost 15 years or 20 years nearby. And since then, it has used at the early beginnings to migrate Clipper applications or develop new applications. And all these applications have grown over the years and they become larger and larger. And um, so issues are now popping up which are related to the size of the teams or the size of the applications or the complexity applications. And with this group of features, the namespaces, we want to tackle one of these uh, problems. So that namespaces are here to isolate symbols. For example, if you have developed in 1.9 a function var to XML and then you are updating to 2.0 and Alaska Software is introducing with 2.0 also a function var to XML. So we have a name conflict, which function shall be used, the one from Alaska or the one from your own library? And this type of name conflicts for functions or uh, class names and things like that are, are happening all over the time, specifically when you have, uh, when you're using add-on libraries from third parties and then uh, the Alaska stuff and then your own in-house libraries. So in with namespaces, you can isolate these symbols, you can avoid naming conflicts or you can handle naming conflicts by prefixing it, for example, to resolve the var to XML scenario, you will declare the, your own namespace in your source code as the default one, so your var to XML is used, and in all the other areas, the default as a default, the Alaska software one would be used. So just by adding um, <clears throat> namespace, your namespace to your source code would resolve the name the name conflict for the complete PHE. The other area where we would extend where we plan to extend runtime is with named workspaces. A workspace is a container which is used to organize all work areas of a thread. So currently in XSpace++ 2.0, you have one thread and one workspace. And workspaces cannot exchange between threads because they're, they behave like the isolation behavior of the connected DBMS system, so they don't introduce an additional type of concurrency. With the name workspaces, we want to have the ability to have 
an unlimited amount of workspaces. They have names and you can exchange these workspaces between threads. You can compare that to a complete data model, for example, opening up different tables, their relations and so on, and their integrator rules. All this can be opened at once, locally or remote, and then you can use it from different threads by moving it between threads or just um, using it in your application. So it makes the organization of the data model in your application more efficient and allows you to be more performant if it comes, for example, when you're developing web handlers, WA applications or applications where different threads are coming in and you want to have you want to have the request handled as fast as possible, then you can use a named workspace because you can open up it once, leave it alive, and from a different thread you can acquire the named workspace by its name and this way avoid opening remote DBMS connections and all that costly stuff like opening tables and things like that. And finally, the hierarchic library names, which is a consolidation of uh, some um, feature set which is very old. When you want to use the add-on library, then typically the add-on library is required that you link the lib to your application and very often you also need to add the include. So two steps for one uh, thing. With the new use command, we will introduce all in one. So you're just saying use XP tools, and then the system automatically looks for the XP tools library and the XP tools include files. So you don't need to write lib and include directives. You are using use in the future. Furthermore, there will be dot star. Uh, wildcard when you're writing these names. So if you organize your names in a hierarchic manner and by writing the dot star at some part of the uh, path of the name, you can include more than one library or you can use more than one library and more than one include at once. So um, the idea of uh, the hierarchic library name feature and the use command is very simple. It helps you to organize larger complex projects in a more efficient manner and don't juggle with your includes and lips anymore. This is then done automatically by the compiler and uh, build the system. The other area of new runtime features is strictly related to data types and the ability to use the Windows, uh, the Windows API. Uh, we will add the date, time, and interval data type to the runtime, which is of course required for Visual Fox Pro compatibility. Visual Fox Pro has a date time type, but we took the Visual Fox Pro date time, added the interval, and this way give you complete temporal arithmetic. So we are again taking what is great in Visual Fox Pro, move it to a higher level, and add it to XSpace++ with all the multi-threading and multi-DBMS exchangeable database engine capabilities. There will be a version 1 behavior switch for the existing database engine, so your old code still works, but you can change the behavior. The default behavior will be version 2 behavior, but you can go back to the version 1 behavior, which means your date time is represented as a string as not and not as a data type. This is for backward compatibility. So again, even so, we are adding a new data type to the runtime. Your existing source code, your existing data, anything works well, nothing needs to be changed. It's full backward compatible. Uh, we also will add a 64-bit numeric integer to the runtime. Currently, the numeric data type is a, so, uh, it's, it's a graduate typing system where the subtype integer is, it's a subtype of the numeric, there's also the subtype float, which is a subtype of the numeric on your language level. As a developer, you don't realize this, but the compiler needs that to do optimizations, increase, uh, do better code generation, for example, a for loop, it's internal just an integer, it's not a float, so different native code is generated and so on. But it has also an important impact when later on <coughs> with the external command, because it having the 64-bit integer now as a numeric subtype gives us the ability to transparently access 64-bit values in Windows 32-bit ABIs. Uh, and another area where we want to change the runtime is we are moving to the UTF-16 format for the runtime internal text representation, which means <coughs> Unicode, 
becomes a subtype of the character. In fact, the character has already an encoding associated and with the Unicode support, we will give you full runtime support, even lens, substring, all that is automatically adapted and works correct for input data, from, for Unicode input data. <clears throat> for that, we will also extend the string representation, as you see here, of the X++ source code. So by prefixing a B, you can say this is binary string, you know, no encoding transformation happens by prefixing a H. You can have the hex notation by prefixing with the U, it's a Unicode string. Inside the CXP system, we will adapt to, to support Unicode. So you can, uh, you basically have full Unicode support on the run part. It's native UTF-16. The only exception is the user interface. All existing X-based parts are still only supporting ANSI. They are not able to support Unicode. At least that's our current point of view here. And then there will be the new external command. The external command is here to supersede or to substitute the existing DLL function, DLL call stuff. The new DLL, uh, the new external command allows you to not only specify the IPI, it's also a fixed typing interface, which means you can basically access any Windows API available. It supports the 64-bit uh, integer float, it supports automation interfaces at a return value or input value, it supports, it has full support for callbacks, asynchronous and synchronous callbacks, uh, by the way, and it has full Unicode support. So, bottom line with the new external command, there is not even a single API on the Windows platform you cannot access with XSpace++ then. The next area, next major area, the first coming uh, and the incremental uh, updates uh, we will do in the forthcoming 12 or 18 months. It's about assets and templates management. Assets are basically a way how we want to deliver add-on stuff to you as a developer with XSpace++ or to Bumel process how add-on libraries get bound and used in your projects. With the asset browser, you will be able to select, for example, the parts pack or, or AngularJS JS for your uh, web application. And it's th these add-ons are then automatically installed into your XSpace++ project. They get installed uh, locally. Your projects become self-contained. So the assets are a way to organize your own framework, third party libraries and all that stuff in a consistent way. The templates are used to increase your productivity by having more predefined templates, not only the console and with 32 bit, we want to have service templates, web handler templates, templates for all different types of applications, including unit testing templates, which is already available with the one of the last updates it was made available. Assets and templates, it's more about how to become more productive with your new projects um, or when you want to use add-on stuff with your existing projects. Let's have a look into more detail into the asset management. The asset management is basically consisting out of three areas. There's one, the GAR, the Global Asset Repository. This is basically an asset repository hosted at Alaska Software. And from that asset repository, you can get all the updates to your local asset repository, which is under your .assets folder in your XSpace++ installation. This is your local copy of the global asset repository. And from your local asset repository, when you are selecting an asset to be used with your project, your web application or your desktop application, the asset gets copied and installed into the asset subdirectory of your local project. That means your projects become self-contained. They are no more pointing to a library which is somewhere installed. They are no more pointing to includes or whatever which is installed as well, which can change out of the control of that project. Anything which is used by that project is in the subdirectories of your project. So again, projects are becoming self-contained. And this is important to understand because this resolves a lot of version conflicts, a lot of, lot of conflicts which are popping up. For example, you have an application A, an application B at your customer sites. Application A is using version 1.9 
and application. B is using 1.9 SL whatever or 2.1 and 2.2 of whatever add-on library. Then you need to manage the installation on your add-on library at a specific place. Uh, you need to handle the different versions and you need to keep in mind that if you are updating the one point or the 2.1 add-on library to 2.2, then um, you need to think about all the applications which are using that add-on. So this is a complexity. And by having all the add-ons, having all the assets installed locally to your project, projects become self-contained and they have more more problems. That's the whole idea of the asset management, so to speak. With the continuous delivery and innovation strategy, we have been able to deliver almost each month new features and fixes to you as a developer. So from our perspective as Alaska Software, we are happy how it worked out because it made us more productive. It allowed us to better focus on priorities, on what is required to deliver right now and not in 12 months and 24 months. Um, in means of the platform, we are also happy that we are moving steadily forward, technology as well as usage-wise. With usage, I mean the growing customer base, but also how VFP developers are jumping on the XBase++ bandwagon. For example, um, they are not substituting their VFP applications, but VFP developers started to realize that the XBase++ language is not that different than a VFP, but in very many areas, much more powerful. So they start to acquire taste, realize they can supplement existing VFP applications by doing something, for example, with the web, doing web applications with CXP or the web handlers or the WAA technology in XBase++. They created connected mobile applications with CXP. Um, some even took their existing VFP application, created a COM component out of their business logic and uh, used that business logic from within their web CXP application. So there are many ways to use XBase++ right now um, to supplement your VFP application. So go ahead, check it out, try the demo. Um, other than that, thank you for watching this episode of All About Code. Hope you enjoyed the roadmap update and see you next time.